Let's proceed to the next law, the Social Security Act of 2018 or Republic Act number 11,199. The Social Security Law came about on July 18, 1954 with the enactment of Republic Act number 1161, otherwise known as the Social Security Act of 1954, but it was not implemented until September 1, 1957. It has undergone several amendments throughout the years. The first amendatory act was Republic Act number 1792, which deleted the provisions on unemployment benefits. Thereafter, Republic Act number 2658 was enacted, wherein the coverage of the social security system was broadened, the benefits increased, and the enjoyment thereof liberalized. Republic Act number 3839 was promulgated three years thereafter, wherein the retirement benefits were increased and the minimum age requirement for coverage was removed. On June 19, 1965, Republic Act number 4482 was enacted, wherein reimbursable amount of sickness benefits advanced by the employers was increased. Thereafter, several other laws increasing the amount of Social Security benefits were promulgated, namely Republic Act number 4857, Presidential Decree Numbers 24, 177, 347, 735, 1202, 1636. Executive Order Numbers 28, 102. Republic Act Numbers 7322 and 8282. The latter having been approved on May 1, 1997. A Social Security Law was enacted under the policy of the state to establish develop and promote a sound, viable, tax-exempt social security system suitable to the needs of the people throughout the Philippines and provide meaningful protection to members and their beneficiaries against hazards of disability, sickness, maternity, old age, death, and other contingencies resulting in loss of income or financial benefits. The Social Security System is the implementing arm of the Social Security Act of 2018. It is a corporate body with a personality separate and distinct from the government, directed and controlled by the Social Security Commission. Coverage of the Social Security Law Coverage of the Social Security Law used to be predicated on the existence of an employer-employee relationship. This is no longer true because the policy now is to encourage even the self-employed to become social security system members. Note those who are not covered by the social security system. One, services where there is no employer-employee relationship. Two, service performed in the employ of the Philippine government or any of its instrumentalities and agencies. Three, service performed in the employ of foreign governments or international organizations or their wholly owned instrumentality. Four, temporary employees if excluded by regulation of the Social Security Commission. Compulsory coverage. Coverage under the Social Security system is compulsory upon one, all employers, two, all employees not over 60 years of age, three, domestic helpers, four, self-employed persons, including professionals, partners, and single proprietors of businesses, actors and actresses, directors, script writers, and news correspondents who do not fall within the definition of the term employee, professional athletes, coaches, trainers, and jockeys, and individual farmers and fishermen, and number five, overseas Filipino workers, whether land-based or sea-based. Voluntary coverage. Spouses who devote full time to managing the household and family affairs may be covered by the social security system on a voluntary basis, unless they are engaged in a vocation or employment which is subject to mandatory coverage. 
when is the effective date of social security system coverage? One, for employers on the first day of his operation. Two, for employees on the first day of his employment. And number three, for self-employed persons upon his registration with the social security system. Note that the mere fact that a person has obtained a social security system number does not automatically make him a member. He will be considered as a member only when he has been reported for coverage and has paid at least one month contribution. When a person registers for membership, he becomes a member for life. Therefore, during such time that the member failed to remit contributions, the benefits and loan privileges provided by the social security system can still be availed of as long as the member meets the qualifying conditions for entitlement thereto. Note the obligations of employers. Number one, to report his employees for coverage. Two, to deduct the employee's contribution from his monthly salary. Three, to pay the employer's contributions. Four, to remit the premium contributions to the social security system within the first 10 days of each month. Failure on the part of the employer to report an employee for social security system coverage will subject him to the following liabilities. One, if the employee becomes sick, disabled, retires, or dies, the employer is liable to the social security system for damages which said employee would have been entitled had his name been reported on time. Two, in case of pension benefits, the employer is liable to the social security system for damages equivalent to whichever is higher between the accumulated pension due as of the date of settlement of the claim or to the five years monthly pension, including dependents' monthly pensions. When is an employer not liable for damages for failure to report? The employer is not liable for damages if the contingency occurs within 30 days from the date of employment. In addition to criminal liability, the employer shall be liable to pay 1. The unremitted contributions plus 2. 2% 2 penalty per month from the date the contribution fell due. The penalty for failure to remit premium contributions is punitive in character. Hence, good faith is not a defense. From the moment the remittance of premiums due is delayed, the penalty immediately attaches to the delayed premium payments by force of law. The employer is duty-bound to remit the contributions without need of any demand from the employee. It is the legal obligation of every employer to remit the, so, uh, the social security system contributions within the first 10 days of the month. With this mandate of the law, demand on the part of the employee for the employer to remit the contributions to the social security system is not a condition precedent for such remittance. The social security system can collect such contributions in the same manner as taxes are made collectible under the National Internal Revenue Code. The liability of managing heads, directors, or partners for unremitted contributions is solidary with that of the corporation, partnership, association, or institution. Under the Social Security Act of 2018, if an act or omission penalized by the said act is committed by a corporation, partnership, association, or institution, its managing head, directors, or partners shall be liable to the penalties provided for the offense. Up to when can an employer be obliged to pay premium contributions? The obligation of an employer to pay Social Security System premium contributions subsists only during the term of employment of his employee. When the employee is separated from employment, the employer's obligation to pay contribution shall cease at the end of the month of separation. 
How about contributions of the self-employed? The self-employed member pays both the employer's and employee's contributions. The monthly earnings declared by the self-employed member at the time of his registration with the Social Security system shall be considered as his monthly compensation. Contributions of self-employed persons earning 1,000 pesos monthly or below may be reduced by the Social Security Commission. The monthly earnings declared by the self-employed member at the time of his registration shall remain the basis of his monthly salary credit unless he makes another declaration of his monthly earnings, in which case the latest declaration becomes the new basis of his monthly salary credit. If the self-employed member does not earn any income in any given month, he is not required to pay contributions for that month. Note the Social Security System benefits. 1. Maternity leave benefit. 2. Sickness benefit. 3. Permanent partial disability benefit. 4. Permanent total disability benefit. 5. Unemployment or involuntary separation benefit. 6. Retirement benefit. 7. Death benefit. and 8. Funeral benefit. The maternity leave benefit is available to female members, married or unmarried, who give birth, suffer miscarriage, or emergency termination of pregnancy. The maternity leave benefit can be availed of for every instance, that is, regardless of frequency of pregnancy, miscarriage, or emergency termination of pregnancy. Note the duration of maternity leave. One, for pregnancy, it's 105 days with full pay, regardless of whether cesarean or normal delivery. Extendable for 30 days without pay at the option of the employee. Solo parents are entitled to an additional 15 days with full pay. Two, for miscarriage or emergency termination of pregnancy, it's 60 days with full pay. The amount of maternity benefit to be paid by the social security system is 100% of the average daily salary credit. The paternity leave pay will be paid in advance by the employer within 30 days from filing of the application and the social security system will reimburse the employer upon proof of payment. Note the conditions for entitlement to social security system maternity benefit. The social security system maternity leave benefit can be enjoyed under the following conditions. One, the member must have paid at least three monthly contributions in the 12-month period immediately preceding the semester of her childbirth, miscarriage, or emergency termination of pregnancy. And two, the member must notify the employer about the pregnancy and the probable date of childbirth. Sickness benefit. Sickness benefit is a daily cash allowance given to the member during his confinement when he is not receiving his wage or salary. The SSS sickness benefit is 90% of the average daily salary credit. The sickness benefit can be enjoyed up to a maximum of 120 days in one calendar year. It cannot be paid for more than 240 days on account of the same confinement. Also, the unused portion of the sickness benefit cannot be carried forward and added to the total number of compensable days allowable in the subsequent year. Note the conditions for entitlement to SSS sickness benefit. Members can avail of the sickness benefit if, one, they have paid at least three monthly contributions in the 12-month period immediately preceding the semester of sickness or disability, or injury rather, two, they were confined for more than three days in a hospital or elsewhere with the approval of the social security system. Three, they have exhausted all their paid company sick leave benefit. And four, they have notified the employer or the social security system, in the case of self-employed members, of the fact of his sickness or injury within five calendar days after the start of his confinement. The sickness benefit shall be paid in advance 
by the employer and the SSS will reimburse the employer under the following conditions. One, the employer shall present satisfactory proof of payment and legality thereof. Two, the employer must have notified the social security system of the confinement within five calendar days from receipt of the notice from the employee. Three, if the employer notified the social security system after the five-day period from receipt of the notice from the employee, the reimbursement shall be limited only for each day of confinement starting from the 10th calendar day immediately preceding the date of notification to the social security system. Four, the social security system shall reimburse the employer or pay the unemployed member only for confinement within one year period immediately preceding the date of the filing of the claim for benefit or reimbursement with the social security system except when the member was confined in a hospital in which case the claim for benefit or reimbursement must be filed within one year from the last day of confinement. Five, if the employee has given the required notice but the employer failed to notify the social security system of the confinement or to file the claim for reimbursement within the one year period, as a result of which the benefit was denied or reduced, the corresponding daily allowance he advanced to the employee cannot be reimbursed. Permanent partial disability benefit. This is available to members who suffer partial loss of the use of any part of his body, specifically the loss of a finger, loss of a hand, loss of an arm, loss of a foot, loss of a leg, loss of one or both ears, loss of hearing of one or both ears, or loss of sight of one eye. The permanent partial disability benefits are as follows. One, monthly pension, depending on the body part that was lost. If the member has paid 36 contributions, prior to the semester of disability. Two, percentage of the lump sum benefit. If the member has not paid 36 contributions prior to the semester of disability. If the member retires or dies while enjoying permanent partial disability benefits, his disability pension shall cease upon his retirement or death. Permanent total disability benefit. This is available to members who suffer complete loss of sight of both eyes, loss of two limbs at or above the ankle or wrist, permanent complete paralysis of two limbs, brain injury resulting in incurable imbecility or insanity, or in such cases as determined and approved by the social security system. The permanent total disability benefit is in the form of 1 monthly pension for members who have paid at least 36 monthly contributions prior to the semester of disability. Two, lump sum for members who have not paid 36 monthly contributions. If the member dies while enjoying permanent total disability benefits, his primary beneficiaries as of the date of the disability shall be entitled to receive his monthly pension or if he has no primary beneficiaries and he dies within 60 months, that is five years, from the start of his monthly pension, his secondary beneficiaries shall be entitled to a lump sum benefit equivalent to the balance of the five-year guaranteed monthly pension, excluding the dependent's pension. The monthly pension and the dependent's pension shall be suspended upon reemployment or resumption or employment upon recovery from permanent total disability or for failure to present himself for examination at least once a year upon notice by the social security system. If the member who has already received a lump sum benefit is reemployed or has resumed self-employment after one year from the date of disability, he shall again be subject to compulsory coverage and shall be considered as a new member. Unemployment or Involuntary Separation Benefit. This is available to employees who have been involuntarily separated from employment 
such as retrenchment, redundancy, or closure of establishment. The unemployment or involuntary separation benefit is in the form of monthly cash payments equivalent to 50% of the average monthly salary credit for a maximum of two months. Note the conditions for entitlement to unemployment benefit. The unemployment or involuntary separation benefit is available to SSS members who 1. have paid at least 36 monthly contributions, 12 months of which should be in the 18-month period immediately preceding the involuntary unemployment or separation, and number 2. they are not over 60 years old. An employee who is involuntarily unemployed can claim unemployment benefits once every three years. In case of concurrence of two or more compensable contingencies, only the highest benefit shall be paid. Retirement benefit. This is available to members who have reached the age of 60 years for optional retirement or 65 years for compulsory retirement. The rates of retirement benefit are as follows. 1. Lifetime monthly pension for members who have paid at least 120 months or monthly contributions, that is 10 years, prior to the semester of retirement. 2. A lump sum equal to the total contributions paid for members who have not paid at least 120 monthly contributions prior to the semester of retirement. The monthly pension of a member who retires at the age of 60 will be suspended if he is reemployed. If the retired member dies and uh, his primary beneficiaries as of the date of his retirement shall be entitled to receive the monthly pension. Take note, the, uh, the primary beneficiaries are 1. The dependent spouse until he or she remarries. 2. The dependent children, whether legitimate, legitimated, or legally adopted. And 3. The dependent illegitimate children. They are entitled to 50% of the share of the legitimate, legitimated, or legally adopted children. If the retired member does not have primary beneficiaries and he dies within 60 months, that is 5 years from the start of his monthly pension, the secondary beneficiaries shall be entitled to a lump sum benefit equivalent to the balance of the total monthly pensions excluding the dependents' pension for the five-year guaranteed period. Take note, the, secret, uh, the secondary beneficiaries are 1. The dependent parents or 2. If there are no dependent parents, any person designated by the member as his secondary beneficiary. Death benefit. If the deceased member has paid at least 36 monthly contributions prior to the semester of death, the primary beneficiaries will be entitled to monthly pension. If there are no primary beneficiaries, the death benefit shall be paid to the secondary beneficiaries in the form of a lump sum equivalent to 36 times the monthly pension. If the deceased member has not paid at least 36 monthly contributions prior to the semester of death, the primary or secondary beneficiaries shall be entitled to a lump sum equivalent to whichever is higher between the monthly pension times the, num the number of monthly contributions or 12 times the monthly pension. Suppose the member, while still unmarried, designates his brothers and sisters as beneficiaries will they be entitled to the death benefits? The brothers and sisters will not be entitled to the death benefits even if the member failed to change the designation of beneficiaries after his marriage. Death benefits under the Social Security law are vested only upon death of the member. Under such situation, the surviving spouse and his children would be entitled to the death benefits. Brothers and sisters will qualify as beneficiaries only in the absence of the surviving spouse and children or of the legitimate parents. Finally, the funeral benefit. The funeral benefit is payable in cash or in kind. It is available even if at the time of death, 
the member was permanently totally disabled or has retired. 